HiSec Buyback offers 90% GDA anywhere in HiSec. Simply go to HiSec.EveBuyback.com, appraise your items, create a contract, and get paid quickly. You're live. Welcome to Talking Stations, a show about Eve Online. Uh, today is Wednesday, November 17th. Uh, I'm your host, Shen. Alongside with some panelists, and uh, we're going to start out with our panelist slash engineer, uh, Nick Bison. Howdy, everybody! Good to see you here tonight. And we have our, uh, I guess, special guest uh, or special panelist of the day. We have Mel. Welcome. Okay, so today we're going to, of course, everyone saw the October monthly economic report. I'll uh, we'll talk about that later on, but we're going to start off with some fights. Okay, just like any other Wednesday shows, uh, we're going to start with War Update. Uh, so this time, instead of going anywhere else in, in Eden, we're going to focus on one special region, and that is Pochvin. So uh, if people have noticed, uh, in Pochvin, uh, there have been two Fortisars uh, that have been lost by Gunsum Federation. So that has uh, being alongside a conflict uh, started uh, with uh, uh, between like Panfem and Insane Imperium. So they had a working deal, well, it's kind of like a non invasion pack inside Pachman where they don't shoot each other. But now that, that deal is kind of broken right now. So we're seeing uh, PH has started shooting uh, the Imperium uh, structures. And here are the two uh, notable ones that we're showing. So this is the one uh, that's in uh, Ala in Pochman, and Horde basically brought an uh, Eagle fleet and then shoot it, and then there was no defender at, at all. And from the battle report, we can tell that uh, a lot of things were dropped. So we can see total value of 56.6 billion ISK uh, were lost uh, during this fight. And if you can scroll down, we, we can see like Horde brought like a decent amount of uh, Vulture plus Eagle Fleet. And uh, on the other side, Imperium uh, saw a lot of ships like those practices and those rooks um, were there, but uh, they didn't work too well uh, along against the Eagles. And is basically a blue ball type of thing. I guess it's fair to mention, you know, when you look at uh, the battle report, um, is it broke? I don't know that for sure, but uh, when I look at 600 uh, folks on the defending side, but 1,300 ships lost, there's a lot of those ships were kicked out after the uh, fort was lost and were just free shots. So, you know, it's not as bad as it looks. It wasn't like just an old-fashioned butt whipping, but it's still was a loss um they but they showed up man and they fought yeah yeah and I, I mean, and you know and i know we've mentioned this probably a half dozen times but i think it bears repeating you know if they you lose a uh, citadel in pochman it ain't coming back yeah exactly so what we've seen since the end of the war is the consolidation of nullsec around two main power blocks uh, one is the imperium which has been rebuilding over the last couple of months and remains active all over the map and the other is a, a much reduced uh former pappy coalition the basic elements of nc dot test pandemic horde are still there um, and these two groups have been clashing all over Nullsec. I mean, these aren't, I think, very serious strategic actions or not deployments or anything, but it's often the case that one side will bat phone uh, Horde and friends, and the other side will bat phone, bat phone Goon Swarm and friends, and they'll, you know, that's where these numbers will come from. So I personally have been in fleets where this has happened in the Great Wildlands and in, um, oh, what was the other? Region. It's on the opposite side of the map, somewhere to the uh, uh, west the, of, of Gemini. Oh, Gemini one, yeah. Yeah, it's not in Gemini, but further towards, you know, Outer Ring and Sinkway is on in that Venno? direction. I, I think there was a big fight there last night. Yeah, it might know. have been. It might have yeah. been Venal. And so here we see it in Pochman, right? So these are three um, very widely separated territories where Horde 
and friends have clashed with um, uh, Imperium. And there are also, there are constant skirmishes, gate camps, rival um, Astrohus is setting up in the in Low Second Forge, where both uh, areas, or excuse me, both coalitions have a continuing interest. So the, you know, the war, in a sense, is not really ended. It's just simmered down in it, I could say. It's, it's moved location, is what we've really seen, I think. You know, they're, yeah. they're still skirmishing with each other, you know, and attacking assets, but nothing critical. I don't believe in my, that goons think Pochfin is critical to their survival by any stretch. It's just a no, cool place. I don't think they care all that much about it. I, I think Horde does care a little bit more about it. Horde has a, um, a, a Pochfin SIG and it's pretty active. Um, but yeah, we've, we've seen these uh, continuing conflict between these two sides, just much lower intensity. Nobody's invading or talking about exterminating the other side, but they're still fighting. Yeah, and also this is a good way to generate some good content for both sides as well, right? There are timers showing up in different areas, and if both sides decided to, to form, then maybe there's a chance of a really, really good fight uh, with both sides with great numbers. And then maybe you see a lot of destructions, which means that uh, it's the industry part needs to come in and it's a whole chain of uh, reactions uh, from, from there on. One of the things I noticed uh, in looking at both of the battle reports, in both cases, you know, hordes bring in that Eagle fleet, you know, the reinforced Eagle fleet. And especially when you're looking at a mock, you know, you've got, a much smaller group and uh, a much more diverse, you know, in the old days they used to be mean and called kitchen sink, but you know, they, they showed up and they fought. So, you know, didn't, didn't turn out real well for them. They lost another fort, but by God, they were there. And that's uh, more than you can say for me, I was at home or actually I was at work. So, um, you know, yes. what the heck? So I wasn't in this fight, but I have been in some other ones where Horde and, and friends on one side and Goon Swarm and friends on the other clashed. And, and Horde can usually outform Goon Swarm for these fights, but not always. When uh, Horde backed uh, Federation of Respect, Honor, and Passion Alliance, and Venal, is it? Uh, RHP. Uh, yeah, sure RHP. Well, yeah. In, in that corner of the map anyway. Um, and Goon Swarm and friends backed Volta. Uh, we got pretty heavily outformed. Actually, had to got chased out of the region, and I don't think we we tried to uh, to assist our HP again after that. So it's not a hundred percent that Goon Swarm, can, that, excuse me, that Horde can outform Goon Swarm, but it often does happen. That. Well, I don't, you know, and we got to go back to I don't think Pochvin's a strategic interest to the Goons overall, um, or to Imperium. It's a nice place to go play. And, you know, they have some, you know, good chance for some ratting and some looting and a few fights here and there. So, you know, hey, more yeah, power these, to these are just these, these fights are just about content, as near as I can tell. I don't think Org really cares all that much about most of these. Although, as I said, I think they are a little bit more invested in Pochman because of the phenomenal PvE opportunities there, which we've discussed on and also i guess it's worth to mention that uh i mean it's not a recent change anymore but the latest change to the rules on the gate where it makes uh is accessible for players with even without standings so i guess that made like moving around fleets much easier for those blocks yeah, yeah, yeah i still really think they're gonna much. they're still gonna shoot me if i show up i don't think the trigs like me at all so <laughs> So it's yeah. really important to get your standing up, even if it doesn't matter that much, but it still matters. Yeah, at yeah. the time when they announced those changes, I felt like the people who had fought for the trades during the invasion or who were willing to put in the work for them should have some privileged access to the space. And I didn't really want to see that change, but um, it has opened up the area considerably. And from everything that I've heard from people in my corp and alliance, um, if you want to do some PvP and not get blobbed or dropped on by supers every time you start having fun, Potchman is where you go. 
yeah, that's a really good uh, place um, for a lot of small game, I guess, uh, activities uh, that are medium size, I would say, and also the ESS as well. Uh, so from this, we're going to move on to our uh, second topic of the day, that is the MER, the Monthly Economic Report, for October 2021. So this devlog or this uh, MER just dropped today, uh, so it's freshly hot, and then we're going to look at some key important things. So I guess the first one we can start out with is always the first graph, uh, that's production versus destruction graph. Yeah, so the main thing here that I see is that uh, production has fallen slightly, but mining is way up over the last couple of months. Um, so presumably we have some uh, raw materials are accumulating in someone's hangar, and that helps explain a number that we see in another graph further on down, which is the uh, declining mineral price index. And this, before we get too deep, just got to mention, you know, quick shout out to Dunk. We're actually using his uh, PowerPoint on this instead of trying to scroll through the actual MER. Really helpful. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um. Uh, uh, we just got a note, I guess. Uh, so those structures that we just talked about, they are not necessarily Gunstorm structures, uh, but they're owned and operated by individual Gun Corps and individual like peoples. So I guess it's not necessarily a strategic interest for the alliances or the coalition, but just some uh, I guess personal assets in parchment. Yeah, I, 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 I did call during during the war that goons had an ally in Pochven that they weren't able to assist because they were all being camped into 1DQ. And they, that they, had, they had some kind of interest in, uh, in Pochven and perhaps that... From a conversation on. I wasn't really part of but kind of listened in on, um, it appears, you know, this was uh, the whole Pochven thing was not a goon-sanctioned thing, that it was individual cores or individuals Kind of going there, making deals, and having a good time. Uh, but the the goon hierarchy or the Imperium hierarchy, it wasn't part of their plan. So, yeah, they're probably not terribly yeah, invested. There, there seems to have been some conflicting understandings about who had authority to do what with with or make deals with respect to goon swarm and uh, uh, horde in Pockfen, But I don't have any uh, firsthand knowledge of. Uh, yeah, let's told people have been kicked from goons for making the wrong, wrong decision. Yeah, interesting. I guess we don't want to get sidetracked to this too much. Let's get back to uh, back to uh, the MER, man. <laughs> yeah. So, what you're going to say, uh, Mark? When we're talking about production and destruction. Uh, you're man you're, so oh, yeah, you were mentioning the mining value was up um, compared to like the destruction. And yeah, so production. So destruction is about flat, production is down, mining is significantly up. So that means you're going to have an excess of raw materials accumulating somewhere. And there can be a number of specific ways that that um, affects the mineral price index, but we'll get to that later, I suppose. Yeah, and also do you think that has to do anything with the war? That's just, well, just not just ended, but ended two months ago in, uh, in August. Right. Do you think maybe, let's say, when people are going home, when those soldiers have more time uh, in uh, in their homeland, they can farm more and then bring out their like big boys, like rural coal, stuff like that, to oh, actually sure. mine a big chunk? Well, I know one group that can mine more now than they could six months ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, um, and I think I really see that reflected uh, when we're looking at different regions of mining value and bounties. Uh, later but on. That said, I mean, you know, goons are known for being very active miners, but I doubt they push that number up all by themselves. I think a lot of people, um, you know, the, the war is over, they return to um, doing their crabbing and uh, pieces of time for rebuilding. So and people spend a lot of this during the war. Now it's time to rebuild. And if you want to get use out of your war walls, now's the time to do it because, you know, it's been clear for a while that the nerf bat was coming for him. Yeah, yeah. So right now we can see the graph. Uh, so destruction uh, is slightly uptake, but 
the mind value and production are really high on the graph as well. Yeah, the mind value is coming up nicely, if you will. Um, but you, yeah, you're right, Mal. The uh, destruction line is you know a little flat right now. But you know the big war is kind of done. But it's it hasn't gone down as much as I would have anticipated with the war being over. Yeah, well, the war was really a war of, of patience, of maneuver, of not maneuvering, of just waiting. And, you know, one side just finally ran out of patience. That's the way it usually happens. You know, the invader has the pressure to overcome the adversary. The stalemate favors the defender. And, you know, in this case, um, the defenders were able to outlast the invaders. But there's something else about this graph I'd like to draw your attention to. If you look at the production numbers, you'll see that, you know, there's that big spike around April and May that, of course, is everybody rage building dreadnoughts and titans before the BPO changes could hit. And you would expect it to fall afterwards. But look, it's never recovered, like anywhere close to where it was before. The high point of the graph after the BPO changes is lower than the low point before. And that indicates what the impact of those BPO changes on production. And, a lot you of know, people have simply exited the, the market. They're not doing anything. Well, the, this is, you know, the production, the red line for the folks that can't read the little tiny print. Um, yeah, it, it's dropped dramatically, but it's also in ISK value. So, you know, there could be, you know, for one, the cost of one dread, you, you're talking, you know, half a dozen well-fit hacks. So the actual number of ships has probably not gone down, but the number of large ships, your, your caps and supers, has, has dropped like a rock. I don't know. I'd love to see a production number on that because I'll bet it's, it's near zero. Well, it would definitely be nice to see a decomposition of this graph. You know, here's the subcapitals, here's Tech 1 modules, here's Tech 2, et cetera. That would be you know, very useful information. I think it's reasonable to speculate that a lot of that um, fall off is the end of suicide dreads and, um, you know, ratting supers and stuff like that. Because remember, it's not, if you're out there ratting in a super, that's a super that can get destroyed and then has to be replaced later on, right? Well, people aren't out there ratting in supers anymore, so that those ships aren't being blown up. They don't have to be replaced either. So, um, you know, this number has remained significantly down. Maybe that was always part of the plan. That shows the impact of those BPO changes. Yeah, I, I've got to agree with you on that 100%, that the, the bulk of the drop in production is due to the, the, the massive change in industry and the difficulties involved in building the large ships now. Yeah, just to answer chat, uh, so we're, what we're looking at right now is the MER from October. So this is the a, a, a dev log about vertical changes and everything just dropped uh, last Friday. So which means that when this whole graph happened, it, so we have no idea about the dev log. So it's not people rage uh, mining with vertical to just ramp it up before the changes come to TQ. It's just normal daily stuff before we know that there's going to be a change to Rokos and workers and all those um, from extraction to destruction death block. Right. So these numbers show for the month that the graph ends at the end of the month of October. So it doesn't account for the last two weeks. Nothing from the new dawn update or any of the controversy around that will be reflected in the numbers. Which, which that said, uh, that being said, we're going to look somewhat of that effect in this month uh, uh, MER, which is going to come up probably next month uh, in December. When we're looking at the November MER, uh, maybe we're going to show, we're going to see some reactions uh, uh, from miners, from producers about the new changes that's going to come to TQ. And is there anything else, uh, some key points they want to mention, Mel? Yeah, let's go down a couple of graphs here. I'm following you on the, the stream. Um, yeah, where do you want me go to go? Down to, um, it's one of the last graphs, money, excuse me, velocity oh. of ISK about two thirds of the way down. I'm getting there. 
All right. You're doing well. <laughs> keep keep going. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so there. Yeah. Okay, so to me, this is the all important graph in every month's MER. Caleb used to love to talk about destruction and production numbers. My view is that the uh, the destruction that matters is the kind that produces new building. If somebody's building and somebody's trading, and so the destruction numbers, the information that matters in the destruction numbers is going to be reflected in velocity of ISK, which accounts for all sort all the trade that happens in new ESC. And this graph is pretty simple. If the number is going up, the economy is growing. If it's going down, it's shrinking. Um, That's in, that a, say, in layman's term. That? In layman's term. The velocity is because basically is that money changing hands from me to you to somebody else is that the turnover of the that isk unit or how do you how would you explain velocity of isk to someone like me sure so um velocity of isk is the rate at which isk is trading hands between players so let's say uh, you build orcas in sync is that right nick I've been known to do that once or twice. <laughs> okay, so, um, so let's say that you're building your orca and you run out of titanium in your hangar. You say, "Oh, I, I want to. I'm not going to hold up my entire production line just so, until I can mine some more titanium. Let me run to market real quick and get some." So you buy some titanium into Dixie and you bring it back. This trade changed hands there. That's reflected in the number. And you produce the orca. You take it to market and then somebody buys it again, then again that is changed hands. So it's not how much ISK there is total in the game, it's how rapidly that ISK is circulating. Now, the more rapidly ISK is circulating, that means you know the more buying and selling is going on, people tend to buy more when they feel confident that they can earn more. You know, you're, like you're not gonna mind splurging on a faction module or better a better ship if it's for example, during an event, which you think is lucrative and you're out running the sites, you get 50 million for this one, 70 million for that one. Well, you could pocket that ISK, but a lot of times what people do is they upgrade their ship or they buy some new boosters, get a skill injector, whatever, you know, they further their goals in the game. So when people feel that they can make ISK, they tend to spend it more quickly. Uh, and that's why I say that when that number is growing, that means the economy is growing. But if you don't think you can replace ISK you spend, well, you're going to think twice before you spend it, right? So when that number declines, that means people are holding back, they're putting off purchases, they're deciding that, you know, hey, maybe I don't need a faction armor hardener, maybe I'll just deal with the meta one for a while or tech two or what have you. It's slowing down key activity in the game. And all activity in EVE is in some way related to the market. That makes velocity of ISK a very good indicator, not just for the economy, but for player activity in general. Question, so, uh, let, me, I, yeah. let me kind of ask you one on this here, because uh, I'm with you, I understand where you're going with that. With, you know, especially when you look at, you know, all, the beginning of August, when the war, the, the big war, because let's face it, there's still folks up north and down south scuffling daily. But when the big war, sure. quote, ended at the end of August, and you're seeing a steady decline of the velocity of ISK, how much do you think that the folks just resettling back in, you know, and, and not venturing out a whole lot yet has to do with that? Well, I'm not sure how much of an effect the, the war has had on this, because, you know, there wasn't that much destruction in the war, really. There was M2, that was a big one. There were a couple other real big fights, but it wasn't a war where people were just constantly duking it out back and forth, you know, everybody reshipping a third and fourth time to uh, manufacturers struggling to keep up. It was, it was a war of patience and of boredom, weaponized boredom, frustration, I suppose you could say. Um, but it wasn't as destructive as one might have thought for one of the, the largest, I think, war in EVE Online's history. Um, the way I read this, this graph is that you have the summer slump in June and July, which is brought about by a, a combination of things, falling PCU numbers, just fewer people in the game because it's summer, 
also because you have people um, checking out because of BPO changes, you have uh, lifting COVID restrictions, all the reasons we've discussed before. And then you see a partial recovery in August uh, with the COVID, excuse me, the COVID restrictions are, um, well, the novelty of that has worn off. Um, people coming back to the game. And there was also, there was an event around that time that was fairly lucrative. I've yeah, so that that's called uh, the Grand Haste event, I think. So that's the time, well, during that entire week, CCP were giving out free ISK to people. Yeah, that's right. Around like 200 million per account, uh, something like that. Yeah, so that right. created a lot of ISK for people where they can just spend it. Like if people with like multi-boxers, maybe have like a lot of like billions worth of ISK that they just got freely from CCP, and they can just spend all of that to buy ships, equipment, whatever they want. That's right. So there was there was an event. There was the, uh, uh, I think CCP, it was like 285 per Omega account, something like that. There was a tax holiday around this time. There was a lot of things pushing on the economy to get it going in the right direction. But as I think you pointed out at the time, Shen, there was a question of, are we seeing a genuine recovery in the sense of a return to economic health? Or is this just like a drug where, you know, you get the effect, you, don't, you stop getting the effect when you stop injecting the drug, right? Um, and I think we can see in the months since that it was really a result of the kind of temporary uh, actions that CCP took at that time. Uh, it's still not as bad as it was during the summer because we're out of the summer slump but it has been a steady downward trend um, since that recovery. And I think, you know, the reason is that the fundamental problems, the things that are still unpopular with the players are still there. You know, well, it would be interesting to see come November or in the November MER, what change that's going to have, or even if the proposed changes, which I guess are wildly in flux, we're going to get to that. Um, you know, what effects that's going to have. Yeah. Well, we're already halfway through November, so if they release it, let's say, something hits tranquility within a week at the most, then you'd still have about two-thirds of, excuse me, a week at the soonest. You'd still have about two-thirds of the month would, would be over. But you can, you'll be able to start to see people, people's speculative reactions to the new dawn. Yep. Is there another graph you want to look at? Another chart you want to hit on? I'll just, I'll just one. I have one more thing to say, which is we saw the reverse of the tax changes at the end of uh, October. That's right. So, so yeah, maybe so that's at the very, I think not the very end, but like somewhat close to the end of October. So that may not have like a whole bunch of effect on October semi-R, but we're going to be sure to see a lot of effect of that in uh, November. So that's a change where ccp reversed well not it's not complete reverse but higher it's a tax uh compared to the three months of holiday tax that we got which means that trading right now may not be as lucrative or may not be as profitable as before or during that three months so maybe we're going to see even a slower velocity of risk uh, yeah after that that's possible ccp has changed the tax system a couple times over the last 18 months or so i've kind of lost track but yeah the holiday ended then they implemented a new system under the new system there's a higher nominal fee but if you have your skills maxed out you pay less than you would have before because the skills are more impactful and if you're a serious trader you of course have accounting and brokers fee and all that to five now um yeah. Ali in Ali Rigged in uh, chat asks uh, if the Plex has anything to do with the velocity of ISK. Is that that would still be considered a commodity changing hands? Is that a correct statement? Yeah, yeah. So if if you put Plex on the market and I buy it, then I'm I'm giving you ISK in exchange for your Plex. So that okay, so that that is velocity. built into the velocity at that point. Yeah, but. On the other hand, though, if you give money to CCP and CCP creates Plex out of nothing and puts it into your Plex vault, that doesn't show up on Velocity VIS because no ISK changed hands, right? Not until I take that ISK that I purchased with cold hard cash, if I turn around and sell it, then it becomes, or sell it in game, I should say. 
Right. Only only if you sell it in game. Same thing with the um, New Eden store. You know, if you buy Plex, Plex from CCP and then spend it on a skin or a outfit or whatever for your character, that doesn't show up on the velocity of this guy. All right. Cool. Any other graph you want? Up. Oh. Uh, just real briefly, the next graph. You can see here um, that big yellow line. There is the mineral price index. As you can see, it was crazy high a couple months ago. This this graph is very compressed. So one one cell is a year, right? So that spike was the uh, rage building capitals and super capitals that it was already quite high before that happened due to the um, redistribution. Remember when they they put noxium and uh, isogen and low sec and uh, you know, they redistributed the uh, the minerals. So it's already pretty high because of that. Then on top of that, you got BPO changes, which were announced about a month in advance. So everybody who could spent that month building dreads and supers went even higher. And um, it's it's been falling since then as this number, excuse me, as this shows. But because of the radical compression of the graph, it looks like it's falling very steeply. In fact, um, I think there's a less compressed. Well, it's still uh, much farther ahead or, you know, higher than it was, you know, shoot, a year and a half ago. Yeah. C can you uh, move over to the next graph, please? The next one down. Yeah, this is much same graph, but much less compressed. Um, here, each one of these cells represents a, uh, a month. So you can see it's still sliding. It's still very high compared to the historical average. Likely, it will never return to where it was before uh, it started climbing in June of 2020. Because you know that was the whole point of the scarcity era was that uh, minerals were too cheap before. But um, but it is still quite high, and I expect it would. Even if there were no ecosystem changes, it would probably continue to slide gradually for some time yet just because these minerals are no longer being absorbed into capital ships, which is one of the main places they used to go. People aren't building them anymore, and even if they were, they wouldn't uh, require as many minerals. Yeah, so to just explain what is that orange line means, that's mineral price index, uh, which is basically generally the price of minerals. Right. So with the blueprint changes, it lowered the amount of minerals that are needed for battleships for capital ships, which means that um, they're less needed, which means that the price is uh, going to go down. Uh, but since the price was already already very high, uh, even if it's go going down, it's not as low as it, what it was before. Yeah, so I expect that number will fall further, um, partially due to weak demand, partially because I think that even though there's some controversy over New Dawn, which I guess we'll talk about in a moment, uh, CCP's general intention seems clear to bring about, you know, that age of uh, prosperity. Um, and, and just one other note about the mineral price index. It's because minerals have gone out of capital and super capital ships, and they're not as important to the economy in general as they used to be, but they still go into an awful lot of things. And if you were going to look at just a handful of goods in order to understand the direction of the economy, then, you know, Tritanium and Mexilon and Pyrite would still be pretty good things to look at. Yeah, with that, um, so that'll be our, like, uh, short analysis on the MER, and then we're going to move on to our final topic of the evening, which is an interview uh, with CCP Ratani. So, uh, Mel, I think you have read this. Can you give us, like, a brief overview of what they talked about? Yeah, so I've read this a couple times, and um, I think, you know, the TLDR here is that um, your uh, Oracle and Orca changes are not going to be reversed. That's what he says here in so many words. Um, so, if you know, if you're out shooting the monument because of that, then... Uh, sorry, sorry, that was my bad there. You know, so if, if that's what you've been protesting or if, you know, you're hoping to see change, I don't think there's any realistic prospect of that. Um, then there's also the waste and uh, compression mechanics. Those things look like they're in for some revision. And we can talk about these in more uh, detail if you like. 
Well, I think one of the huge takeaways, even before this uh, came out, was, you know, when they first came out with the uh, the blog on what's going to be coming, you know, part of it, they were asking, hey, get on CC, test it out, tell us what you like, what you don't like, here's where the thread's going to be. And I think, you know, yeah, the initial rollout and expectation was not handled optimally. I'm being very polite. But they've been very responsive. And as far as when I say they, CCP, of taking feedback from the players and from CSM and, you know, and here they're coming out going, okay, you know, we got to make some adjustments to this. But there's a couple items, like you mentioned, Rorks and Orcas, like, nope. We're not going to, we're going to kind of dig our heels in on that one. Yeah. So I, one thing I've heard and read quite a lot of over the last couple of days in the discussion around um, these new dawn changes is that CCP doesn't listen. And so even though they say that we should go on CC and test things out and they make a big show of caring about our feedback, really they don't. It's all just window dressing. And you know, I haven't been playing this game as long as maybe some other people who are, I guess, a bit jaded, but it's not clear to me that that is an accurate characterization. Uh, players said, we don't want uh, standing locks on the gates in Pochford. They're gone. Players said, we hate cloaky camping. Cloaky camping has been significantly nerfed. Players said, we hate dot one isking and Jita. It's gone. Players said... One of the first things I remember hearing about the ecosystem in Jita, excuse me, in uh, this game, is that rock walls are out of control. They're ruining everything. There's no loss has no meaning, and here, you know, they've been hit with an earth bat. Actually, this is the second or third time over the last couple of years that they happened. So, you know, Eve Online is a vast gaming product. It's not really possible for them to f fix everything. See. Let me just go back a second. Eve is not really one game. It's like 12 or 13 games that all share the same code <laughs> in the same community. But the low sec small gang PvP is playing a fundamentally different game than uh, Malaclips high sec industrialist and trader is playing. And, you know, so they do what they can, I think, with limited resources. Also, they're, they can't devote their entire efforts to responding to players' uh, requests. They've got their own visions and goals that they're pursuing, as we've seen with the revamped new player experience, which players have also complained quite a lot about. So it's not obvious to me at all that they don't care about player feedback. And they say they put this stuff on CC because they care about getting that feedback. And I, I tend to believe them. That doesn't mean you're going to get everything you want. It means they're listening. Tell you, and you know, and, and as far as listening, you know, and and I definitely uh, recommend folks pull this thing up and read it if you haven't. But also, uh, Dunk did a write up, which is mentioned in here also, on basically the good, the bad, and ugly from his point of view. Pop over to his page and read his blog on it too. It's some good insight. You don't have to agree with all of it or disagree with all of it, but the man puts it, it's well constructed well presented and uh, you see the other sides of the story that you don't always think of but I'll, I'll post that link also for you yeah so um dunk says in his write-up which is quite good that um he voices one of i think the more consistent complaints about the new dawn changes which is that uh he says players who own orcas and work walls are owners of ships that don't justify their build costs only the safest and wealthiest areas of New Eden will see these fielded, further pushing the player meta to join only the biggest and most powerful groups, reducing diversity in corps and alliances. Uh, well, okay, so here we have, you know, the obligatory, what about the new bros? I think the real issue here is that the orcas and, are, excuse me, corpuses aren't, work walls aren't going to be the monster miners anymore. Um, are, are, do, is it true that these people now own ships that don't justify their build cost? Well, uh, I, I feel like uh, maybe like from another perspective, which is for future Oracle pilots who are looking at getting into Oracle, are they going to justify their cost? Right. For people who had their Oracle, let's say, just survived uh, over the few years during the abundance era, um, I, th I think pretty much they have earned their cost back. Like, 
to somewhat of a degree, right? But the people who are really hesitant about it are the people who are or who just got a roll call or or who are looking at it or they have like enough ISK, like just just the right amount of ISK thinking, should I invest the ISK into a roll call? Should I do it on a drug? They're all just standard capital ships that cost not that much different. So what should I do? I think there are the people who are somewhat hesitant. Well, you don't want to buy a work wall right now. You want to, if you want a work wall for the future, for whatever reason, you want to wait until everybody is fire selling these things because they think they're worthless. And then, you know, you can get a good deal and then price will bounce back and stabilize. Probably lower than where they used to be, but um, not as, uh, uh, yeah, but a little bit higher you know, than the, you bought them for. You know, and you brought up a good point for the folks that, you know, have been in the game, you know, four or five years when, so they've never known the Rourke to be anything but the super miner. So it, if you came in and you wanted to mine or be part of it, it's like, that was the end state. That was the goal. And it's, you know, and realistically, Hulk and the Mackinac are the goal now. And it's funny because I go back to when I started, which was pre-Rourke -Rourke and pre-Orca, but Back then, CCP on more than one occasion said, nothing will ever outmine the Hulk. <laughs> and and we're actually getting back to that, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so it's a perspective thing in a lot of it. I absolutely get the newer players that have never known anything but this being the way to go. And it's like, yeah, this is going to hurt. You know, it, it, if you're solely a Rourke pilot, yeah, this is going to hurt a bunch. But uh, I'll be happy to help you out, you know, learn something new. Yeah, um, yeah so I think uh, Dunk is, is right that if you take him to mean that these ships will now be massively overproduced because they don't have the same utility that they used to. But that will normally, excuse me, that will work itself out eventually because people just won't build them as long as they're, uh, they're more on the market than... Uh, the players actually need. Um, are the have the players who are not going to be able to monster mine in these things? Are they being disenfranchised? Well, they're that the way of playing the game that says what you do is get into a rock wall, crab up either another rock wall or a dreadnought, and then just rinse and repeat over and over and over again. Like that way of playing the game is probably going uh, on on its way out. But you know. Eve is bigger than just crabbing up your next dreadnought. Um, there are other earning opportunities or other things to do in the game. You know, try flying a subcap up. Well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't belittle people, but um, my point is that, yeah, things are, are changing. There was never any promise that these things were going to be monster miners forever. And if you've had one for the last couple of years, you have surely made your investment back many times over. I mean... Like, a, like, am I to understand that all these Rorqual pilots didn't make enough to afford a couple skill extractors? Or, all the years? or you know, if you're a Rourke pilot, what did you... I'm sure we didn't stop training as soon as you got into your Rourke. You got, you do other things also. It may not be your primary focus, but, you know, anyway, read the yeah. article, so, check it out. So I'd also like to talk about... Um, CC, uh, Rotati's stated reasons, because when he's asked about the work wall and uh, the interviewer says, you know, people are upset about this, the way he responds is by explaining, for I'm sure, you know, not for the first time, why these things need to change. He doesn't say, well, we've heard you, okay, we're going back. He doesn't say it's not working as intended. He says, here's why we're changing. That, to me, is the strongest indicator that, you know, they're not going to budge on this. Um, so he says... Yeah. The argument he makes here in this article is that Rourke walls, well, yes, they were very powerful for the person who used them. They disenfranchised the newer players because they mined so much and produced so many materials that dropped the value of raw materials. And that made it so that if you were mining in a barge or a venture or an exhumer or whatever, then you were just massively inefficient and that activity didn't justify the investment. So, you know, your progression as a new bro miner would be 
do a bunch of nonsense until you can get into a rope wall and now you're a real miner. <laughs> you know, which just makes the problem worse, right? Because if a rope wall mines like five times as much as a, a, a barge, then that's five barge pilots who whose jobs have been taken, right? By this one work wall. And of course, plenty of people have more than one work wall. So you're talking about 15, 20, 25 barge pilots then, right? So he's saying, this is, is really oppressive to people who are just starting down that career path. And that's why it needed to, to change. And I, I haven't heard a good counter argument to that in all the complaining about these work wall changes. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. And you know, and the other thing that he mentions is, you know, and it goes back to my point about people saying CCP doesn't listen, you know, and right in there, it's like, admittedly, the new compression system doesn't seem to be hitting the mark. You know, all right. That's a little bit of an understatement, but they're looking into it. OK, that's huge. I mean, there are feedback from work playing on CC and checking and running the numbers does make a difference, you know, and right. so this is this is good. And. You know, and the fact they almost, almost quote dunk here about changes that add tedium always brings me back to Dunk's remark about weaponizing inconvenience, because that's actually, even from my perspective, was pretty accurate in this case. So they're looking at it. They're listening. You know, things are going to change. We haven't seen the final yeah. group yet. Can you explain more, Nick, what you mean about weaponizing inconvenience? Well, I yeah, ideally I'd have Dunk here explaining it, but basically, um, you know, taking a mechanic that we're used to, like in this case, right now, when you want to compress, you head over to a station that's got a refinery, you toss it in there, right click, compress, boom, it's done, no waste, no loss, no time, all right? This is adding time and waste to it and in addition to that that ship has to then sit outside in a, an industrial mode which makes them you know they ain't moving they ain't going nowhere and you can't tether at that point in order to compress and it takes time and compression is also going to slop over when i say slop over both time and loss into the stations so they took a mechanic and kind of went overboard, making it really inconvenient and diff not difficult, but inconvenient and time consuming to do. Right. So you can see the difference between the way that Rattati responds to complaints about compression and the way he responded to complaints about the work will change. With the work will changes, he just restated his reasons, hopefully in a way that you know people will understand where he's coming from. Here he says, so with compression, we're definitely hearing all that stuff, and we're pulling it back to improve it. Like, no question about it. We're not going to go with this unchanged. He just said that three times. He says, you know, it's not going to go on to tranquility the way you've been testing it on CC. We're taking a hard look at it, and uh, people say CCP doesn't listen, but, you know, here are people. this was one of the main complaints about the new Dawn uh, changes, and here he says... We're taking it back to the shop. We've heard you. Uh, I, so just oh, go on. Yeah. I think it's also um, interesting to look at his reasons or um, the rationale he gives for introducing this um, compression mechanic that takes time. He says, it was meant simply to be a counterweight to going back to the station and dumping it there. So if I'm out in my uh, work wall and I'm mining, right? If I want to if I want to go back to the station to do my compression, well, I'm not a work wall pilot. Let me talk about a ship I know. Um, if I'm in my uh, Mackinac and I'm out there in the belt, I'm mining, um, I have to offload my ore. I can either offload it into an orca or I can go dock up, right? And eventually, though, if I, for preferably, I would have that orca there to capture a lot of that ore. But eventually, I'm going to have to go back and, you know, make a trip to the, the station, right? And that's going to mean lost time. Either lost time that I'm not getting boost to my miners or just lost time that I have to spend looking at. It's just inconvenient, right? Um, so here he's saying, 
now you, you would, the idea is that you would choose between you can take the, your loss of ore in the compression process or in the time that you spend going back to the station. But now you have, you have a gameplay decision. You have to calculate, am I using ore, ore this way or that way? And that is adding uh, gameplay and a decision point to what was previously a flat, uniform process, which was that if you could compress ore, you always did it because it was free, uh, instant, lossless, and it added value to the, to the ore. So you would just always do it. And that's what he says here, that they're trying to add gameplay decisions. Where you can, it gives you some insight into how they're thinking about mining. Yeah, so, I mean, they're adding those uh, values, I guess, in making different decisions. But I think... A lot of what a lot of players are complaining about is the weight on each side or the cost on one side is too great uh, than the other, right? So with the examples that they're given in that video, right, twenty eight days of a fract of moon takes uh, just one broco with one compression module, I think, forty some hours uh, to uh, to compress. It's a big number. It's a lot of time. Um, it's uh, i think people are just upsetting about the actual amount of time maybe if, let's say to shorten the time right this is why ccp needs feedback they want to know what player think is a reasonable amount of time for them to adjust to or what they're suggesting and then ccp can take that into consideration and then change the liver uh, up or down and then to make uh, to find a happy medium between themselves and the player base yeah, I expect that the time compression will be reduced significantly um, because the the complaint here seems to be a valid one. I haven't heard anybody offer a strong uh, rationale, or really any rationale, for why it should take this long or that it or that it is taking uh, too little time. So there seems to be pretty broad agreement that this is taking too much time. And uh, Toddy says, "Okay, we've heard you. We're not going forward with this unchanged. You can expect." Um, a faster compression process in the new dev block, which before I forget, um, there was a meeting with CSM and um, the devs who work on this, and there's going to be a dev blog coming up. We don't, I don't know when, but um, it's reasonable to think within a week, maybe two. I, the I would guess. Players reactions. Yeah, I had forgot about that. I heard that the CSM had met with. Uh some CCP folk about that. But for some reason, I want to say, I doubt if it's going to be this week, but it's way too early. But probably, I would guess mid-next week would be a, a reasonable timeline. Yeah. Well, so before too much longer anyway. We usually don't get uh, multiple dev logs in the same month, but, you know, here it looks like, well, we've seen the importance of getting it right. <laughs> you know, when you say something in a dev log that is off, then... You know, you see the kind of reaction that we get, so it'll probably take a little bit of extra time to make sure it's it's uh, improved. But uh, clearly, those uh, CSM has communicated with um, with the devs. They've they read your forum posts. Uh, people say that they don't communicate. Well, this, that's what this interview was. Probably CCP or Toddy called up this guy from the this gaming journalist and said, hey, yeah, here's this thing going on, let's let's do an interview, and now we're here talking about it. So it's an indirect form of communication. Um, you know, and just just so you all, you know, realize, well, I'm sure you do. I mean, we've all been, whether it's us sitting here slapping our gums together or the folks in chat, you know, it's not just the feedback uh, from folks that are on CC and then directly into the forums. But a lot of folks that go through their CSMs, and the CSM has been quite active in, in in this whole process. So that's, you know, the system can work. It sometimes a little ponderous, but uh, it can it can work. Yeah. So I'll just answer one question. I think I saw like a decent amount of time ago uh, in the chat, which is asking, uh, what's the compression? How is it going to work post patch? Or how is it described in the previous? Uh, uh, Devlog. So what they described was in stations you can instantly compress stuff, but you take a loss. But right now, but in that devlog it says if you're in a roll call with high skills, it's basically no loss at all. It's like I think 99% or something like that on like normal war and gas, but it's gonna take time. 
and it's gonna take a long time. Uh, if you're going to that uh, interview and then go down to the video to explain a 28 day um, moon frog can take like 40 hours uh, around that time. And then it's very tedious. So it's, it's a trade off that you have to do. Yeah, and, and that's not one work wall. That's like, what did he say in the video? Like four or five with five compression uh, modules fitted to each? It's like two rockles with 10 compression modules. It's going to take about 4.5 to 7 hours. And okay, so one... that's... I'll tell you, you know, I, I kind of... All right, I'm not chuckling at it in the... at the expense of anybody, but uh, for quite a few years, I was one of the three Rourke pilots in my entire alliance prior to Rourke's online. And yeah, we'd have mining ops based around the availability of a Rourke pilot that was willing to sit inside the POS shields and, you know, do nothing but pull in ore and compress it and then toss it out to a freighter when we got full. And we would do that for eight hours at a shot, you know. So, yeah. yeah so, yeah, are there Rourke pilots out there that are willing to do it? Possibly, you know. <laughs> Yeah, there are probably not going to be, well, there definitely won't be as many work pilots who want to do the, uh, the fleet support role as who want to do the solo monster mining thing, but that is still a role for the work wall. And there are some hints in here about what they're thinking, like maybe uh, the work wall would be able to bridge a mining fleet around. That seems pretty cool. I would really like it if there was a, like a covert ops, or excuse me, a black ops mining command ship. Like something like a, a work wall, excuse me, not a work wall, but a, an orca that's maybe half the size and half the capabilities. But a porpoise. Has a, well, but has a covert ops uh, cloak and a, jump, a covert ops uh, jump bridge. Oh, generator. okay. I, I see what you're and, saying. Yeah. So like, like ninja maybe, mining. May, maybe, yeah. Like maybe if the um, your, your enemy has a good moon, but they're not quite keeping their eye on it. You can jump in the fleet real quick and mine a bunch. And then you see one of them come into system and you figure, okay, you start the clock. We got two minutes to get out of here before they can, you know, form to wipe us out. Or, you know, there could be some cool gameplay around that. You know, with the newly introduced type C crystals, right? With all those like really, really high waste and high yield, uh, uh, crystals or low yield, I guess, uh, and then high waste crystals that can be really viable, I guess. Uh, in, yeah. in, a, also, in a scenario it, like it, that, yeah, you're absolutely right, Jen. I didn't even think of it in that respect, but yeah. yeah. So, to be to be clear, though, in this interview, there's no hint that there's going to be a black ops mining command ship. That's not what they're talking about here. They're talking about using the work wall. They're looking for other roles. For the work wall so it will still be an aspirational ship so be something you want to get into but it's not going to be the monster miner that's the problem that they're trying to solve one possible solution is to have it uh, bridge mining fleets around but they haven't committed to that. yeah or jumping i think it's going to be similar type of thing as the black ops battleship uh, ability that they newly introduced in the last uh, black of uh, uh, change patch which is right now you can jump with your entire fleet or with like vicinity amount of uh let's say miners uh mining ships around you you can jump the entire fleet to let's say industrial sino or just normal sino uh, i i think that's the way they're going it's just my guess uh but we will have to wait and see yeah and when they when the rourke was first introduced um it was pitched as this is going to be your you know capital industrial ship you're going to load up the bay with uh you know your fleet hangar with mining ships you'd have a clone bay available in the rourke people would put their clones in there jump the rourke into the space they wanted to mine everybody would jump out and grab their ships mine load back up and jump out that was the original how it was pitched so it's very different, but that was an interesting gameplay. And so the, the problem that I see with this, uh, just one suggestion they're talking about, as I said, they haven't firmly committed to this, so it, should, it shouldn't be an expectation, but it's a possibility. Uh, a problem I see with having the work wall uh, bridge a mining fleet around is that it, in one sense, it's redundant. If you control territory, you already can put up an Ansiblex and you're reasonably safe on the gate if, you're, if you are covering your fleet. So uh, you don't need it in your own territory and you're not gonna offensively mine with a work wall either, it's too expensive. 
Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's going to take the enemy about 20 seconds to form if they see a hostile work, <laughs> you know, on their R64. You can kiss that work all goodbye. So um, it's not clear to me what the use case for, for that would be. And perhaps uh, I, think, it's one of I think one thing that's possible, which is called escape. Escaping. Let's say show, uh, hunters show up in the next door system. You still have uh, a bunch of miner beside you. You just finish your industrial uh, in decor, and then it's too late to align. So early, let's say just enter the system. You can flee jump or just come to a jump them out to another system. That may be a possibility. I guess. Yeah, maybe you could use that for um, for low sec, right? Where that's where a lot of the mining value is right now, and there are areas of low sec that you know who controls it depends on what time of day it is <laughs> you know so um yeah. you could see it in that maybe so also i think they touched on at the uh, later part of the interview is the waste right so waste is another idea that tcp newly introduced uh, in the last step block and they talk about waste uh in this in this step block and especially the impact that potentially it's going to have on new players right so the complaint here from the players has been that it's because the lower um, the lower skill mining modules produce a lot of waste, you're not going to allow the the uh, newer players to mine the good ore because they're going to screw it up by wasting it with their you know inefficient mining modules. So that is a nerf to the new bros and. That's what you know. A lot of people have been saying about that. Of course, you. No. You yeah. know, they'd, they'd be mining the exact same amount that they would today. Be, we, assumption that rock doubles in size. So if, so if rocks one hundred today, it's going to be two hundred tomorrow. And if I'm mining with a hundred percent waste on the module, on you know, I'm still going to get my hundred. That second hundred is going to go away. But there, there's your incentive to get a better module or train the tech too and with crystal and bring that waste percentage. And it's not a thing, it's a percentage chance of waste. And it, that drops down into the low 30s and might be lower, I'm not positive. But again, those figures are being looked at also. So That's it ain't carved in stone yet. Yeah, so uh, CCP Rattati kind of... Um... He doesn't say as clearly here that they're going to walk it back um, as he did with, uh, with the compression changes. He says, basically says, we understand that this is, could be uh, tough on the new bros, and we didn't think of that. We are looking at this again. But what he says is, we're happy to rework it into a different schematic, reverse it in a way that new players don't see it, and the choice becomes a better choice, whether to waste or not to waste. So that suggests to me that they're going, they're rethinking this mechanic, but it, it's not somehow, like it, it could persist in a different iteration, but not as uh, visibly, right? So there was a hobo leaks uh, drop over, over the last couple of days that showed the uh, waste attributes simply being removed. And some people said, oh, well, it's going away entirely. Uh, well, not so fast. It might just be changing shape. It's not clear here what they're thinking about doing, but it is clear that they're dissatisfied with the waste mechanic as it uh, currently exists on uh, Singularity. All right. Yeah. Anything else on that, Shen? What did we miss, man? I think we touched on the three biggest topics that they... Uh, they talk about in this interview, which is just do a recap. Uh, the role code uh, being left out in some way, right? During this patch where people who bought it felt like it's not really worth the value and, uh, and CCP is looking into that. Second one is the compression, right? So it's, uh, right now it's a tough choice between either you lose a lot of things or you're gonna, you have to sit in space for a long time. And third of all is the waste, right? The waste uh, that's that's going to have an impact on new players. So, I with this segment, uh, I just want to end on one th uh, one one quote uh, from this uh, interview. So, if you go to the sixth last paragraph, the starting of that paragraph, that, that's a really good sentence. 
the sixth uh, one down. Oh, so that's down one. more? No, just up more, up more. So up more, one a bit more. Yeah, so uh, I'll just stop there. So right there it says, while the protests themselves caught the attention of CCP games over the weekend, the feedback is is what is winning the day. So I think that's a really important and really powerful quote. Um, I think really feedback, uh, like CCP are really listening to the feedback and players are really giving them and the communication is the most important thing here, I believe. Yeah, uh, please don't flame the devs. Doesn't, just, just don't, please. Well, it doesn't help either. So, you know. Doesn't help. But, I mean, how do you feel, you know? And I mean, somebody, if somebody listens to you and is respectful to you, you're more likely to listen to them. But if the first thing you hear from somebody is, hey, idiot, you're screwing everything up, stop it. And, you know, you're going to tune that person out. So, you know, it's one thing to be frustrated and protest and, you know, that's all fine. But, you know, don't try to get people fired or, you know, call them names. It's not, it's not done, please. Yeah. So uh, the last bit of news, uh, so there's going to be an extended downtime tomorrow uh, on the 18th of November. Uh, so that's a Thursday. So it's going to be like five minutes, usually like three minutes, but just this, I'm just five minutes. Uh, wait, no, it's five minutes. It's, oh, it's going to be no longer the feminine and tranquility be accepting connection again, 1120. So, uh, so it's going to take a bit of time uh, until 1120 UTC that you're able to connect. Uh, so just be patient. If you just uh, do it at a regular time after downtime, don't panic. See, uh, Eve is come, coming back at 11.20. So with that, any last words from both of you of the today's show? I'm good. Well, I'm still excited. I'm still excited to see what's coming down the, the pipe. I haven't, um, you know, I, I think they're going to do their best to get this right, and I'm willing to give it a, a shot. I hope other folks will give them a little bit of space too. And Nick? I, you know, we're not going to make, you know, everybody's not going to be happy. Everybody's not going to be mad. It's going to be somewhere in between. But I'll, I'll be along for the ride either way. Well said. Uh, so today, so this you're watching uh, t Talking Stations. Today is November 17th. Uh, thank you, Mal. Thank you, Nick. And thanks uh, to the audience uh, who are watching live and watching on YouTube. Uh, good evening. Good night, everyone. See you. Good night, yeah. Good night. See you tomorrow with Rundle. <laughs>